Welcome to Wyoming's Wind River Country. Centrally located in some of Wyoming's most scenic and diverse landscapes, Wind River Country is magic for those looking for quiet, quaint, laid-back leisure and adventure. We like to come up here every year. My wife loves to ride horses and I love to fish, so it's a, it's a good balance. Coming up on this episode of The New Fly Fisher, we're exploring some of what Wind River Country has to offer. There we go. Woo, fun. And looking back from today at what the region was like, what it is today, and just what might the future bring. That's a great technique for this time of year, just because water's a little colder. That's fun. That's so fun on a hopper. It's perfect. <laughs> you, you, you were doing the same thing I was. I said, well, heck, the dry flies <laughs> under. Maybe it's, maybe the fish is on there. Okay, see how that branch is sticking right out? That was perfect. Oh, he's a big yeah, fish. Right oh my gosh. Size fish. Absolutely fantastic. Mm. Nice. Oh my goodness, that's the kind of fish they make stickers out of. The new fly fisher is supported by Wind River Country. Scientific Anglers. Trout Unlimited. WeatherTech Canada. We at the New Fly Fisher have a wonderful history with the Wind River region of Wyoming. Having experienced the fishery years ago, we look forward to returning to the rivers of the wind year after year. That is a beautiful cutthroat. Ugh. And there's good reason for that. Buddy, wow, that is just, that's what you come here for, eh? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's what we're looking for all day. Awesome. The fly fishing opportunities in Wind River Country are seemingly endless. Gorgeous brown trout and high mountain streams just outside of Lander, Wyoming on a do-it-yourself just perfect. Towns such as Dubois, Hudson, Lander, Riverton, Shoshone, and the Wind River Indian Reservation are your home away from home to access the excellent rivers in the region. Right across Wind River country, there are incredible places to stay, go, adventure, and of course, fish. And the history of the area is prevalent in all towns and villages in the winds. Echoes of Native American, cowboy, mining, and exploration history are everywhere. It truly is an incredible area to explore, and of course, <laughs> to fish. The fishery the Wind River affords is as unique as the history of the region itself. From massive reservoirs to tiny mountain creeks, there are fly fishing opportunities literally everywhere. And whether you decide to stay at a lodge, dude ranch, local hotel, or campground, guided and DIY opportunities abound. On this trip, we will be fishing out of Dubois and Lander, and we'll be visiting with the Fox family at the Bitterroot Ranch, the Betts family at the Absaroka Ranch. Woo! Oh my gosh! That is so pretty. And fishing with great guide in Lander, Wyoming, George Hunker. But first, what trout species are available to catch on the fly in Wind River Country? 
waters of the Wind River region are diverse in trout species available to target on fly. Be they wet flies or dry flies, the fish are generally willing to eat a well-presented fly. Oh, oh, that got a top eat. Species include rainbow trout, brown trout, lake trout, brook trout, golden trout, and of course, the state fish of Wyoming, the cutthroat trout. We begin our Wind River adventure on the Bitterroot Ranch with Byard Fox and his family. Well into his 90s, Byard has been in the West for a very long time. He's seen change and also works to affect it. It's an old French name. It's a unique name. Never heard of it before. But Byard, people call me no nickname. No, just Byard. Don't call me Foxy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, am 94 now, and I first came to the Pacific area in 1971 when I retired from the CIA and bought this ranch. But I made my first trip west in '43. When my father was a naval officer stationed in Puget Sound, and he got a leave and took me on a pack trip up here around Yellowstone Park for two weeks, and I fell in love with the West. <laughs> Byron Fox is, is, there's no question he's a visionary. I mean, his, he is a big picture thinker. He is the sort of person, if you, um, his whole entire life has been, there have been arcs of passions of his that he's made a reality. There are people who are practical and can think about the steps that need to happen, and there are people that see the dream. And Bayard is a person who sees the dream. He's the person, I think, centuries ago, he would have been an explorer. He would have found, you know, he would have, he would have literally probably sailed to the ends of the earth because that's just, he, he's brave and he's bold and he's fearless and he, and he dreams big. We gradually built the place up. My wife came in 78. She's been a wonderful partner for building this place up. A terrific rider. And uh, actually, she was a world-class athlete. She held the British record for running the half mile. The Bitterroot Ranch, I think, is an oasis of peace and sensibility and reason in a chaotic world. And it's changed very little in the 52 years I've been here. There is small town charm. You know, whether you are find Dubois or you find Lander or you find Riverton or you find Pinedale, it is local people, local businesses who know, meet you, remember your name and want you to come back and will be happy when you do. And then from those small towns, that's easy access to what we are well maintained for service roads leading into really beautiful and pristine environments. You know, and, and I think that the local culture around here is one that really, really does respect the rivers and respects the spaces. So things are kept clean and there's not much pollution. And it's really, um, it's something that is Rare and rare in the world, I really do believe that. And I think that um, people come, when they come here once, they often come back because they feel, they feel welcomed. They feel welcomed and also feels undiscovered. We're surrounded by game and fish property, national forest, Indian reservation, and it's totally protected from the outside world. There are fewer and fewer places in the world where there is so much preserved land. You know, and you come out here and we're at the end of the road for the National Forest and we're surrounded by public land and we'll go on rides and go on hikes and go out fishing. And there are so many times where you look around and you can see nothing for miles that's man-made. And that's, you know, pretty rare in this day and age. So it's, I think it's a real true escape for people from kind of just the pressures that, that we all exist in the modern world. We've got, uh terrific horse herd 
but my wife especially is built up. And often we get uh, couples coming where the husband doesn't want to ride, but he can fish. And the wife has wonderful riding opportunities. We've set up the rides so that uh, everybody has a group appropriate for their skill. And my wife is an expert at assigning the right horse to the right ride. How's it fishing? <laughs> it can be great, or it can be frustrating as hell. <laughs> About, I think, seven years ago, they said for cutthroat trout, catch and release only. And that improved the fishing. So uh, I can't think of a, a better place to spend my life he will forever be a living part of it. But I also think that the wisdom he had in protecting it and the way he slowly built it. So, you know, as you see being here, there's no huge garish buildings. It wasn't like he did some massive air conditioned hotel and then brought people out to kind of be near a beautiful wilderness. He wanted people to be immersed in it. So yes, there might be a mouse in their cabin. Yes, the, but it's it, you're, you're, you're in it. And I think that it was, he approached it with real thoughtfulness and, and in a slow way. He didn't speed through kind of building up and he let it happen organically. And um, I think that that's something that I know that Richard and I want to carry on, um, meaning thoughtful and purposeful decisions, nothing um, quick and unnecessary. I asked Byard if he wanted to add anything to his interview once we were finished. Yeah. Boy, did he ever. I would like to say that I've been tremendously worried by our polarized government. And I wonder what the future of our democracy may be now it's been so shaken by the events after the last election and i worry about the fact that we haven't attacked climate change which is not a hoax and we need to face that problem or we're not going to have any trout left. But not only trout fishing, but our world is under threat. And we're squabbling over petty things rather than attacking the huge threat which mankind faces and has refused to acknowledge. And the Fox family afforded me the opportunity to fish their little piece of heaven. Joining me is Randy Stalker, a regular guest at the Bitterroot Ranch. We're up here at the Bitterroot Ranch in the Absorca Mountains of Wyoming. We're fishing a stretch of stream that probably has a couple fishermen a year. My wife goes on a trail ride. We're both inexperienced riders. So she takes a gentle ride up on many different trails up here. And she just has a ball. And it's nice that she lets me pursue my passion. What we usually do is we ride in the mornings and I fish in the afternoon. But when I heard that the new fly fisherman's coming up here, I said, I'm not riding on Tuesday morning. I'm gonna go fishing with these guys because I'd love to meet them. I watch your videos all the time and I'm glad to fish with you guys.
Nice. All right. This is exceptional. I'm fishing with a uh, mahogany done. Uh, it's barbless and it's a dry fly. Um, we come up on this little creek here at the Bitterroot Ranch and, and uh, not five minutes in, we've got our first nice little cutthroat. Oh, swam out of the net. He's gone. Oh, well, there'll be more where that came from. What a battle with that tree. All right, moving up. There we go. Whoa, downtown. I knew it was just gonna be a matter of time before I found a pocket that would hold one. Now, to get this guy to the net, this fast to water. Got him. You know, it always makes me nervous when you catch a fish in the first two minutes. And uh, I did that and then it went quiet for a little while, but it seems like these cutthroat are hanging out in these little tiny pockets out of the fast water, uh, which is typical. Um, so I've got a, a mahogany done, dry fly, it's a little wet right now, barbless. And uh, I'm gonna stick with it because I've been here for 10 minutes and that's too cutthroat already. Okay, so once you've caught a fish, oftentimes your fly will be slimed or soaked. Um, what I like to do is go up to the thicker butt section of your leader, double it over like so, take your fly and hook it on the looped over section. And then with your thumb, you can shake the excess water off by flicking the leader, dries it off sufficiently so that you can put your floating back on and uh, you're not mixing floating in water. It's a great way to keep your flies dry and keep them right high. I'm gonna move up a bit, do you mind? Go ahead. I've had two on this. All right. Yeah, I can put on a stimulator. Same, basically the same thing, looks like it. All right, the mahogany seems to be doing the trick for sure. Barbless fly just pops out. Look at those iridescent gashes. They're just fantastic on these fish. See you, bud. Curl up. So I've said it a thousand times if I've said it once. With cutthroat, you need to let them come up and eat the fly and actually turn. They'll come up super slow, eat the fly, and once their head goes back down, that's when you come tight to them. If you hit them on their way up when the fly's right in the mouth, nine times out of 10, you're just gonna pull it right out.
This pool looked way too good not to have fish in it. Just a little guy. There are fish up to 20 inches in here, but oops, there he goes. Good little cut through. Let's see if we can get a big one. Another cut through in a pocket. Now, how am I gonna land you? I'll just swing you into the softer water. There we go. Ooh, fun. You know, it doesn't matter the size of these fish. Anytime you can take trout on a dry fly, it's absolutely ideal. Just perfect. Look at those. Gash is so fun. All right, 20 inches, here we come. So I saw this fish surface just behind this rock and uh, I placed this big mayfly right where I thought I saw him and he came up and ate it. And you know what? It's not a giant, but it's the best fish of the day. Fantastic, fantastic cut through. Beautiful fish. Now I'm in a bit of a curious spot here to let this fish go. Um, because there's a shoot here and a shoot here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a step forward and I'm actually gonna let the fish go behind my legs, which will create a back eddy. That way, the fish isn't gonna get whisked away out of its pool. So, legs together. Fish out. Fish behind me. And there he goes, back up into the pool. Perfect. This big green mayfly seems to be doing well this afternoon. Another little, little cutthroat. Great little fish. Thanks, buddy. So good. So good. I was hanging out. I'll take this fly out of my finger. Everything will be great. What a way to end the day. Great fish from a great river with great people. Bayard insisted we stay for dinner. Who am I to turn him down? It would be my pleasure. The next day, we drove into Dubois, Wyoming. The Betts family have been staples in the community for generations. Bud and family operating the stunning Absaroka Ranch 
and he and his son Robert are co-owners of the Cutthroat Fly Shop in the heart of Dubois. Dubois uh, has uh, roots that go back to the late uh, 1800s, and it first started out as a stage stop uh, on the way to Yellowstone uh, in the late 1800s. But over time, oh, over about the last 30 years, Dubois has turned into really an authentic tourist town. Not in a negative sense. Everybody thinks it's a tourist town. It's, it's full of crowds and, and, and ticky-tack things. I don't think Dubois is that way. And if you look at downtown Dubois um, and it, what it looks like, it's, it's, a, uh, it's really an authentic, cool-looking little western town surrounded by uh, mountains, great rivers, uh, um, great outdoor uh, amenities. Dubois is a special oasis, I've always called that. Uh, you can drive up three, four different valleys and get a different experience each time you drive. I was really lucky to have grown up on the Apsaroka Ranch, the guest ranch. My dad had, you know, taken on a big passion for it when I was a kid. I moved over here in my mid to late 20s here in Dubois. And we came over here, I, I bought a guest ranch uh, 40 years ago now, uh, a guest ranch uh, in the mountains west of town here. We built that ranch up over the last 40 years. The guest ranch is, is my daughter's direction in life. She runs the guest ranch along with her husband. We are an all-inclusive, so you get your lodging, your meals, and your activities all for one rate. We uh, work on a Sunday to Saturday basis or a Sunday to Thursday basis. Usually I have people that stay all week. You get three meals a day. Our main activity is horseback riding, ride in the morning, ride in the afternoon. Options for hiking, options for sitting and reading a book in the aspen trees. We don't have a stream per se right on the ranch. We offer half day and full day fishing excursions for our ranch guests that book there. And they usually book for a week at a time. They start in the middle of June, go through Labor Day. Over time, we have developed a reputation among our guest ranch people of, of being having great fishing opportunities where we go out for the day or a half day uh, by vehicle, uh, take lunches, take, uh, to take water and out for the day. And we're able to access uh, all these great tributaries of the wind uh, on a day basis out of, out of our guest ranch. By the end of the week, I want you to want to come back here and I want you to feel like it's somewhere you can come and, and you know the routine and you know everyone here. In the meantime, I learned how to fly fish, brought those, that, those, those experiences over to Dubois. We included fly fishing as part of our package for our guests. And so we transferred that to this shop when we bought the shop, my, my son and I, when we bought the shop about five years ago. The fly shop is full service fly shop. We have all the gear that you may need, especially for walk and wade uh, scenarios. You know, rods, reels, nets, waders, boots, the whole get up to get you out there, plus a lot of clothing, plus some outdoor gear as well. The biggest thing I'd say is that when you walk in here and it's your first time, we'll of course um, recommend that you come take a guided trip with us. Around the area of Dubois, you can expect to catch four different species of fish. Um, brook trout, rainbow trout, cutthroat, and browns. Dubois in general is really special because I believe that it's a, it's a place that hasn't been found necessarily. So when you go out to fish here, you can expect that you might be the only people on the water. You might not see anybody else. And I think it's, it's opening itself up to um, more visitors and people that are finding out about it, but I also think that's what makes it special and um, makes it a place that you know, professional anglers are, are aiming to find. I think the fishing here in Dubois has gotten better over the years for various reasons. Our Wyoming Game Fish Department is a super professional, super well-run agency. Let them breathe a bit. Oh. Right. Thank you, my friend. Nice job. In a large section, the Game and Fish has instituted uh, catch and release fishing uh, in the Dubois. And 40 years ago, we didn't have that. So a lot of these streams were basically, not entirely, but somewhat fished out. And the fact of catch and release fishing not only 
instituted through regulation, but also through custom and culture, through the new type of fly fishing that we have, has, wow. has meant that there's more prolific fishing that goes on here in Dubois. Um, but the cutthroat are certainly active. Let's sh show you some flies here on the table. For anyone coming in here, our main goal is to kind of figure out what your plan uh, is, now. what your goals are, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, we've been using a lot of hoppers. Even if you're not gonna take a guided trip with us or you've been here a lot and you know it pretty well, we still are gonna be very knowledgeable about all the hatches that are going on. We are gonna be knowledgeable about how certain places are fishing. Um, I'd say a great standby for the whole area uh, is the pheasant tail. What happens in Dubois, at, especially during the runoff, is only a few places end up being fishable. This year we had a ton of rain throughout the summer that muddies up a lot of the rivers, but coming here, you know, we know what spots may be clear, what lakes you can maybe go to. And in general, we're trying to get you set up for however long you're gonna be here or for wherever you're going as well. Like the last time you're here, it was. And with that, I picked up some local patterns and took Robert's river location recommendation, I hit a nearby stream to try my luck. Here we go. Took a little bit of time, but we finally got it figured out. Had the mahogany done on for a while, then switched to a, uh, a hopper, then went something a little bigger profile than the mahogany. And I moved a lot of fish with the mahogany, so I decided, why not just go back to it? Like, you're moving fish with it, continue to use it, and a couple casts in after changing flies, I got a nice little rainbow. Sweet, that's fun. There you go. Little Wind River rainbow. There's some big fish in here. I've caught them. That feels like a cutthroat. Kind of ate like one. Ate slow. It is awesome. Yellowstone cut. Look at that gash under his throat. Spots concentrated towards the tail. Fantastic little cutthroat. There you go. Sweet, that's fun. Not too bad for an hour of fishing close to town. What do you have on? Do you have on a, b a bigger hopper that you can see better? Why don't you Fish that one, Mark, at a, a same same thing that she did. Fish that that edge, the, the right-hand edge of the current, and then reach over the top to that other side, and I'm gonna change her, her fly while you're doing that, okay? It's day three of our time in Wind River country. So a lot of people will cast and put it in this white water. And Today, we are tagging along with George Hunker, owner of Sweetwater Fishing Expeditions in Lander. So always put it in where you can see it on the first cast. George has been guiding in this area since the mid 1970s and knows the entire Wind River area like the back of his hand. We've had one strike on a hopper. We haven't changed. 
George has invited us to fish with Robin and Mark Fetzer for a half day of guided fishing in Wind River Country. Okay, let me do one, one last lesson here for you guys okay. for the future when you get wind. Okay. The tighter the loop is, the better it penetrates the wind, right? And how do we get a tight loop? Tight loops are, are formed, all loops are formed by the amount of arc in the fly rod. Okay, so if I go from here to here, I'm gonna have a big, loose, open yes. loop. But if I go from here to here, I have a tight loop and it goes into the wind. And notice also that you can have a tight loop way up in the air here like this, and then the wind gets it. I can bring it low, I can bring it up a little bit, and I'm using the same arc in the rod, I'm just tilting that arc, you know, from here to back here. So you want to tilt, most of the time, you want to tilt your arc more forward so that um, it finishes right over the water like that okay. with a tight loop. So less movement of the rod overall. Certainly don't take your rod all the way down on the final cast because that opens up the arc, which opens up the loop, which means that the... Um, like that? Yeah. And remember also, Principle one, George's principle one, tip down, slack out when you take the line off the water. Tip down, slack out, okay? And if you can't get the slack out and you don't have too much wind, then roll cast it, then pick it up, then throw it. Good job. See how much better that was? Yes. Of course, the wind was helping you out there too. <laughs> okay. <sighs> You're excited. Yeah, there's one rising kind of in that bowl up in there, down from the willow. I told Mark that fly fishing, I feel like you you think similarly like a gambler. You're like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hit it, hit it, hit it. <laughs> when people are gambling and you're doing it. I, I use the same uh, thing, you know, like playing poker, that we're trying to maximize our chances each time we do anything. And uh, we don't leave, and we try not to, we know that chance is involved, but we try to take the chance out of the situation if, if at all possible. Okay, now just watch the bobber okay. and hold your, what since do I you do don't have any, and we may have to, uh, we may just have to hold it low, but if it stops, you okay. know, like that, then you wanna, okay, be ready here. Just go downstream or up. So I've got a pretty heavy nymph on there for a deep, good good job. And if you can, strike the other way. So go down, like set downstream. the hook downstream? Yeah. Okay. I got one. Yay, hey, hey, hey. Oh my gosh. We're in deep gookie here with this tank car rod because you don't have a reel. But just play him a bit. Okay. Play him a bit. See what happens. Oh, we got a we got a Rocky Mountain whitefish here. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are uh, pretty an indigenous fish, and they uh, they let us know that the water quality is very nice. Okay, so, how so do you, you bring back it in? up a little bit. Okay, you back up. Just keep backing up, and at some point with this much line, we've got to kind of manhandle. Grab the line. We got to grab it, but we try not to grab it too much, or else we'll break him off okay. but but the the rod is pretty darn forgiving so you know I'm kind of just easing him over here okay oh my gosh <laughs> the uh, the guides in Jackson Hole were at one point uh, promoting um, promoting good job promoting <laughs> promoting uh, smoked whitefish because they they didn't like the whitefish but uh, but the whitefish are good to eat. So, so what's it called? A whitefish. It's, it's uh, similar to a grayling. Okay. Yeah, similar to a grayling. And you see it has a really tiny mouth. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, it has like pointy nose. Yeah. No touching. You don't touch fish? <laughs> you don't I touch fish? I try not to. Okay. <laughs> Hey, 
Okay, move up about a half a foot. And now try a little bit to the left of the butt of that log in that brush. I gotta smack it down. Do you mind if I grab onto the Go rod ahead. with you at the same time? Yes. You're gonna, you and I are gonna do this together. Okay. Okay, we're gonna keep it right down low, low on the water. Like that. Womp it in. Okay? Okay. And this time though, you want to land it a little farther up there, get let out a little bit more line than we had there, just to the left of that brush pile. Oh! It's okay, it's very close. No, it's come so off. Oh, okay. yeah. Woo! Yeah. Oh, it's a little This guy. one looks like a trout, probably. I would think, I would think this would be a trout. There should be a fish right in here. It hit that center of that, yeah, right there. Stop, oh, you got one, good, a good fish too. Good fish. Don't go upstream if you can help it, because I see another fish in there. And yeah, uh, keep him, if he wants to go under the bank, then slant your rod and, and keep him pulled out. And you can, if you want, let him go down here. Okay. Wow. Awesome. Yeah! Oh my gosh! Yeah. How does it feel with that three weight? It's gone, buddy. Oh. I can't even get him in the net. Oh my Turn gosh, his head this that way a little huge. bit. huge. Turn his head this way. Come on, buddy. <laughs> on a two weight. We can't turn his head oh, on a two weight. Two? Oh. oh, three weight. Okay, here we go. Now keep sliding him. Slide him. Go. Slide him. Okay, there we oh go. Oh my gosh. Awesome. That is so pretty. That's nice. You want to let him go? Huh? Or you want me to do it? Doesn't matter. You can let him go. Well, that was well done, and the drift was good. Is that it over here? Did it slide all the way over? Is that a huge bug floating in the water right there? By his, just down from where he was casting. It looks like a dragonfly, doesn't it? Okay, um, both of you yeah. are trying to cast fairly high out in front to be delicate. And when we have wind, uh, when you leave the cast pretty high up, it affects the, the cast more and moves it more. So in these situations where you're feeling quite a bit of wind, you want to just stop that cast low, real low, and even splash the dry fly down. Okay. Even splash the dry fly down. So it would look like, you know, it would look like that, as opposed to leaving it up in the air like that and drifting, yeah. So I noticed both of you are doing that. Um, the other thing, you, if you noticed on the last cast, you were, this, this thing goes back that way, and so you were trying to mend the situation out of there. If, instead of trying to mend, you throw it up, and then you just reach and take all of that slack off of that hole you know i'm just i'm just reaching out there and keeping that line off of that hole rather than every time you mend with line here like this it brings the fly back over this way out of the place where you wanted it to be so work on that we call that i don't know watching the drift and line control but um but you know a lot of times you can you you don't have to mend that thing uh there are a lot of people that have gotten 
in the habit of the first thing they do, as soon as that fly hits the water, they automatically mend. And that's a bad habit to get into. Okay. Especially the smaller the stream you're in, you want, you know, that fish is gonna a lot of times hit within the first, I mean, instantaneously almost. And if you've already mended it, you pulled that fly away from it. So, you know, throw it in there and just, just see what happens. See what happens to things. Thank you. Okay, we got that. Right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're gonna leave. We're gonna leave a bunch of rods right here. Let's leave those rods right here and let you and I go on up here. Okay, that's fine. No, no man's. What's that? No man's. Okay, try this one. This one you can see a little bit better. That's where the fish are going to be if they're going to be right there. Whoa. Oh. Ah. Ooh, it's another good one. Kind of boring in there, isn't he? Is he a white fish or is he a rainbow? Rainbow. You're the rainbow king. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Be ready. See that? Yeah, right in the center of the current. See if you can get one about a foot to the right of that, more on the edge of the current rather than the center. Good one. But I'm going to get the Tenkara set up to put it in this thing. So kind of in that shadow, yep, under those willows. Good oh. job. I'd written that one off already. But Mr. Persistence, Mr. Persistence, Yay. thank you for being delicate with these guys. How fun. Good job. Good job. I love mountain fishing. I love being able to look at the water and then look up and just see beautiful scenery. We've seen nobody else out here, which is great. And uh, much rather be in a pristine area like this than crowded elbow to elbow. Well, I would come this time of year. I think it's perfect, it's beautiful, the leaves are changing, it's not too hot. Fishing is, is much more than just catching fish, right? It's the experience of being outside and to be in this country, be surrounded by mountains, such beautiful terrain and such a variety of terrain is just amazing. Equipment for this Wind River fly fishing adventure is as follows. We are using 9 foot 4 and 5 weight rods with matching 4 and 5 weight weight forward floating lines. Reels were mid arbor. Leader setup was 9 and 12 foot tapered 3x leaders with 3x and 4x tippet. Dry dropper was the choice of flies. It's our final day fishing in Wyoming's Wind River country. I pulled a rattlesnake here too, but I don't usually think of this as rattlesnake country. George has invited me to join him on a river close to his home in Lander. Who am I to say no? When I started, I was the only guide on the east side of the Wind River Mountains, and the fishing was fantastic, and we thought we had everything to ourselves. And the fishing has really held up pretty good, but you know, some years we say, ah, is the new amount of pressure that we're receiving affecting the fishing? And whether or not that's the case, it affects our attitude towards the fishing. We do see way more people fishing in our local area. Not always are they as respectful as we would like to uh, see. If you saw somebody on a lake, to respect them and to respect the wilderness, you should just avoid fishing there completely and make yourself completely scarce. 
and your temp situations, all that sort of stuff should be well removed from lakes and uh, trails and streams. In the front country here, like they do in New Zealand, you shouldn't just jump ahead of somebody. If you're gonna fish that stream, you should follow at a respectable distance behind them so that they never know that you're there. You should avoid um, your presence infringing upon somebody else's presence in Wyoming. That's my feeling. We have 500,000 people in the state and we like our space. So space is space and space is not seeing anybody else. And that is the uh, critical matter as far as I'm concerned. Then again, the best thing about the people of the area and one of the reasons that you want to be here is that in a, any situation, you'll have support. Wyoming is at least 50% federal lands, BLM and forest and national parks. And so all of that land is public. So 50% of the land is public land. In Wyoming, the bottom of the river is still owned by the owner of the land. Public fishing is either in official easement areas or in federal lands. The biggest thing that I try to stress is taking care of the resource, not camping too close to the water or the lakes and making yourself a little bit farther away from everybody else. And of course, taking care of the fish, um, but the fish tend to be resilient. We've believed for ages that this is limitless, limitless. Our resource is limitless and it's not limitless anymore. Wyoming is kind of the Alaska of the lower 48 in some ways, and we'd like to keep it that way. That was a little one, wasn't it? Yep. Something hit the nymph or something. Is that a heavy nymph or not? It's got a bead head on it. Yeah. That hopper wants to ride upside down. It's a pretty big hopper for not being able to see it very well. <laughs> you want to net this guy yeah, for yep. me? There's a dropper on there, so. Oh my gosh, look at this. <laughs> That's a worthy adversary. As you get farther and farther up, I would expect that our chances are better. I don't know why. I guess because we haven't seen that many in the bottom of the pool. Oh, see that? Right on the bank. On the right-hand bank? On the left-hand bank. Up by the foam? Uh, no, the, there's a big round rock. See where that riffle is? Right, yeah. Right against the bank, right in there. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Not the one we're looking for, but we'll take it. I always like to see a variety of sizes. Absolutely. I was on a, and it's even worse in a lake. <laughs> I tried not to fish this way, but I was in a lake in the Wind Rivers and there were a bunch of golden trout over the drop off. Good cast, be ready. <laughs> bunch of golden trout over the drop off and they keep mill milling around, back and around. They're not feeding on the surface, but 
<clears throat> I tossed a big like a stimulator out with a small nymph underneath and that really was like watching the clothes dry because there's no no current you got a um, market on those little guys don't you yeah I do all brown trout so far occasionally we'll catch a rainbow in here but not very often come on guys come on big one we need some surface action You got a good one coming up, Mark. but it's big fish. I've got 4X on here. Come on, buddy. This run looked just too good not to have fish in it. I worked my way up and I think he came out of that, out of that slack water there. Now there's a bunch of shelves and rocks in here. You wanna keep your rod tip high, keep the leader off of those pieces of structure as best you can. See, he's digging down, trying to get himself into those rocks. Nice big rainbow. George started the day with a beautiful brown trout and uh, we've been catching pickles ever since. Oh my gosh. Come on, baby, come on. Finally found a worthy adversary, yes, eh? Yes, sir. Making me work for it, I love it. Oh my goodness, That's what a That's a big fish. rainbow, that man. That is a big rainbow. Big rainbow. Oh. oh. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this guy. I can barely get my hands around him. That's where they should be, but they don't seem to be there. <laughs> that one took the nymph. Sure I changed, I changed nymphs. And that, and that hopper was in that same position, but he didn't uh, come for the hopper. Wyoming's Wind River Country. An amazing place with wide open space. The fishing is fantastic, as are the people, the landscapes, and the towns within. That's about all the time we have for this episode of The New Fly Fisher. Thanks for watching. For more on our series, check us out on all our socials and at thenewflyfisher.com. Remember, adventure is out there. All you need to do is go and find it. And what better way than to do it with a fly rod in your hand? From everyone here at The New Fly Fisher, thanks again. And hopefully we'll see you soon in the wilds of Wyoming's Wind River Country. The new Fly Fisher is supported by Wind River Country.
Scientific Anglers. Trout Unlimited. WeatherTech Canada.